Okay, hello everyone. Um, yeah, my name's Ian Hope. Um, I'm basically going to take you through what we've done over the last three to four years, and it's by no means a, a finished product, product or anything we've got perfect. We've still got lots of things we want to improve on. But yeah, we're going to focus on how we use the GL assessments, and I'm going to sort of assume a certain amount of knowledge of the progress test and the caps as we go through. I realize I may have put quite a lot into this, so there's some bits that I will go through quickly and other bits that I'll focus on as I go through. So first of all, just to look at the, the context, um, I'm not going to read through all of this, but the context is there. The British School Jakarta, uh, the primary section, for instance, is about 650 students. We teach the national curriculum for English and maths with some modifications for our context. We use the international primary curriculum for other subjects. We're also non-selective, but we do also have certain criteria depending on what we can support. So there are instances where our individual needs or EAL can't support certain learning needs. We've been here quite a while. We're a founding member of FABISIA, uh, the Federation of British Nas International Schools. We're a not-for-profit school. And about six years ago, the head brought in the use of the GL assessments, at Pi and Pim as they were then. And uh, over the last three to four years, we've been developing how we use that to impact learning and to feed back into the learning cycle. Okay, so one of the things that we've really worked hard on with the staff is the understanding of the importance of assessment, uh, moving away from the view of it being uh, something that, that's done to, in a sense, but something that's integral to everything that we do in our teaching and learning, so that um, the assessment that we use, the GL is, is assessments are very useful in terms of the review of the teaching, but also that that's, that's alongside the internal systems we have about ongoing forms of assessment that are done you know, every day, every minute in terms of the classroom as well. So it's about the, the validity and the, the combination of those two. Now, uh, what we use... Uh, for GLS education is we use the Cognitive Ability Test, the CAT4. Um, we use them on entry to the school for admissions for years three to nine. Uh, we also uh, use them in year three and year six as part of looking at the, the whole cohort of those year groups. We also use uh, the Progress Test in Maths and English, the PTM, PTE, um, as part of our end of year assessments. And it's, we've been looking at how we use the data from those to feed back into the learning cycle to help us identify key elements that we need to focus on. So um, this is basically quite a, a full list of the things, if you like, of what we use and how we use it in a variety of ways, those different types of data from the assessments that we do. Um, <clears throat> The ones that really I'm going to focus on quite a lot are going to be the ones in the middle here, the PT, PTM, to identify trends in learning of cohorts and significant subgroups uh, and to feed back into learning and school improvement. The ones in bold for the PT, PTM are the ones where uh, I'm not going to touch on those too much today simply because I've probably put an awful lot into this and I need to um, focus on key, key elements. So, looking at the first one of those, admissions. So, we use CAT4 and the progress tests on admissions, and we're looking at basically trying to get the key information about the children, uh, about learning styles and their attainment within, against our curriculum, and any uh, additional needs that we may have. Uh, English is additional language, EAL is a big one for us in our context. Uh, and individual needs is one that we need to be aware of in terms of can we support the needs of the children in terms of what we have provisioned internally. We've also started to look at the extreme learning bias, the spatial and verbal from the CAT4 tests, and this is something that we've been developing as well. Okay. So in terms of identifying learning styles and needs, this is, a, this is an older uh, spreadsheet that we'd use, but the key elements for us are using the CATS to look at what the verbal deficits, which I know Matthew Savage has done a lot about, which is the difference between the nonverbal in purple and the verbal sections in orange, to see the difference between the standard age scores, 
Um, if children have a verbal deficit, it's often a good indicator of EAL needs, possible EAL needs. Also, if they have a low nonverbal score, that's usually a good indication for possible IN needs, and that often triggers then on entry um, a, a secondary assessment that's needed from our individual needs department or our EAL department. So we look at the verbal deficits and we look at IN indicators, which could be a number of things as a way of trying to identify possible issues on entry. Um, we also, as I said, we've started to use the, the spatial and the verbal bias as being something that we can use to help identify particular learning needs, both on entry and when we do the assessments in year three and year six for the whole cohort. We use this often to help um, add extra data and to validate teacher uh, assessments and teacher knowledge of the children. So on this one here, for instance, this one is for a, a year three group. And looking at these ones, the purple section at the bottom here, we had one child in this group who falls into the extreme spatial bias. And these areas in the purple over here and the orange over here, the areas we've been looking at, to see is there something in it that we might need to do to help support those children with their learning. Um, here, for instance, this boy that we had with the extreme spatial bias, we talked to the teacher about how that child was learning within the classroom and we're starting to develop our use of this and it actually in terms of the learning advice that comes from that helps us to start identifying ways to support the child in class and adapt the way things were being taught so that if I flip over this is an example of the learning advice that comes from the extreme spatial bias we did it did actually validate what the teachers internal assessment and their knowledge of the children was so we could see a child who their attainment was often uneven. Um, they were very good at problem solving, but did struggle in terms of how to explain or show their, their strategies and methods. And so the teacher was working on adapting how they delivered the lessons and what support they gave with this child to help support their learning. And that's going well at the moment. It's in its early days, but it's something that we're looking at on entry as well now. Um, we do also look at the using the PTE and PTM, the progress test in English, for the reading and the maths, to look at where children are on entry against our curriculum attainment. So um, <clears throat> we do use this as to have a look at basically where they are coming in in comparison to our year group. And also if they have lower scores, that flags up a secondary assessment that we use in IN or EAL to see whether we can support those needs. Now, the vast majority of the time we take in the children, but occasionally, as you can see, of the fifth child down, we do, we are unable to support their needs. And so this is a criteria that we use to help with our assessment on entry. Moving on to how we use assessment, the PTE and PTM to measure progress in reading and maths. Um, what we what I've got here is an example of something we would do in terms of our end of year assessments. We'd look at the progress of the different year groups, and I know I've got these as as, num, as letters on here, but they are mixed up and they are anonymised for with our staff as well because part of what we do on our initial look at the data is we try to make it anonymous so that we take any uh, emotional aspects out of that and we mix up our staff when we look at it. Um, but what we'd do is we'd look at our data from this, and particularly the progress element, we're looking at the difference that we're making, to look for, for instance, what went well. So we've got these two areas here where there's been some very good progress made, and we look at those year groups, uh, drill down into those as well. We look at where support needs might be and the reasons for that, what might be needed to help support the development of those areas. Um, and then we take that down, we also give the class level and we have a look at the areas in which um, how the attainment of the progress is going so that we can use that data. For instance, we have number five there is the, is the lower maths group, the 16% attainment. So we'd expect lower attainment against our criteria, but the one and a half average progress here, sublevel progress, is one that we would look to be boosting because 
we should be getting the best progress we can with our lowest attaining children. And so it's led to us looking at how we adapt, how we group, and how we uh, support children in maths as well. Um, we'd also look at, for instance, what went well. We can see some classes who have uh, high levels of progress. Uh, and the high levels of progress, it, we look at why that's happening. Is it something that to do with the look at the children individually in the class? Is it something to do with the teaching methods that are happening? And also the classes that might need more support. So if the attainment's lower, that allows us to look at that class for the following uh, year or term to put in extra provision or support that's needed to help support that class. So it helps us to respond to the learning that's, and the support that's needed. Um, patterns alongside that, we, it's really important that um, we also compare this data from the online assessments from the GL data to go alongside our own internal assessments, so our own informal, uh, formative assessment systems. Um, because often what will happen is that the, the teacher knowledge and the teacher understanding of the children on an individual level will help to um, really identify and, and personalize the learning so that we're not just relying on one piece of evidence but many. And, and often the, we find that the PTM, PTE and the CAT data can either or both valid, valid, sorry, validate the uh, the feelings of the teacher about that child, but also spots new areas or patterns in the learning as well that we've not identified so that we can try and uh, uh, respond to those to improve the learning. Now, obviously, the, the ongoing assessment the teachers do that we use alongside is gathers from a wider source of evidence. It also uh, brings in the teacher's understanding of the children at an individual level um, so that we can look at that against the data we get from the online assessments from the GL. So one of the th areas that we have found really useful and that we're trying to develop more is that with the progress test, for instance, the maths one here, the reports actually give you a clear breakdown of the curriculum content areas. So we can see that the PTM report gives you number, geometry, measurement, statistics. And this is these areas help us in terms of defining our teaching and our curriculum as well. But also, I know with the, um, the, the curriculum from the UK, the idea of the mastery elements in mathematics are very important. And we've developed our own, if you like, five key areas for mastery in mathematics. So these five areas here, and it's, it's really supported us in terms of the PTM assessment that they actually also break this down into process categories and that those actually link to a number of our key areas for mastery in terms of our mathematics as well. There are areas, of course, that you can't see on uh, an assessment like this, but it does help to reinforce them back and help us to identify patterns in those other areas of mastery that we've been working on as a focus. Okay, um, this is one of the ones where we've done quite a lot of um, work and where the PTM and PTE is really useful in terms of drilling down into patterns within learning within the cohorts, but subgroups. We have key subgroups that we've looked at within our, our, um, our cohorts and our, our school. So just looking at this, this is one attainment comparison. And I know I'm throwing a lot of information here and I'm going through this quite quickly, but this is this allows us obviously to look at the standard age scores and look at children who are at or above expected uh, the expected on the pt ptm band being the 90 to 110 on the scale i think the scale goes from 59 to 141 and we'd look at our attainment against that and also our progress against that um, however we do have a number of changes within our cohorts. Our cohorts are quite transient with students. Um, we need to identify key subgroups as well as our intake changes across the years. So we break down this information to have a look at subgroups. Now, there's an awful lot of data on there, but basically this is, these are our key subgroups, our I and EAL, our key language groups, Indonesian or nationality groups, Korean and English, Attendance is another one that's key for us in terms of looking at patterns with that. And also how we support children new to the school and how quickly we can get uh, their access to the curriculum, particularly for EAL students coming in. 
So we look at comparison of this and the year groups do as well. So this is year A from that data that we had and we then focus on key areas. So if we look just at the IN and the EAL aspects, we can see that um, the progress rates, we can look at the progress rates, we can look at the attainment to see how our different subgroups are doing within that and is there anything about how we need to target our learning or our support to hit those uh, key subgroups. Um, we've got our IN group up here who 10.7% of the, this year group and we can look at their progress rates against the norm for the cohort and against the norm for the school and we can see about which areas in which we're achieving good progress, which areas we're achieving slower progress, and whether we need to change the provision to help support those things. Now we can see our IN children, what we need to really work on, we've identified from this year group, is the progress rates that, uh, that's being made in the maths particularly, uh, but also we can see that our EAL groups are performing really well. So we can then also have a look at our language groups. Now for us, the Indonesian section of ours, the 25% Indonesian, these are our children who are long-term at the school uh, because of where we are. And so it's really important to us to see about those children who are here for many years about how, how, what our impact is with those groups. A relatively new group for us are our Korean students who we've had a change in demographics over the last couple of years because of change in employment patterns. And so we've got quite a sizable Korean group as well who often need a lot of um, EAL support, English as additional language, um, but we can see then about their progress in the maths and the reading and we can help to identify and drill down into individuals from this uh, and our English speakers there as well. We have got, um, we do, we think, you know, attendance is really important for us and we've worked very hard in terms of making sure our attendance is good. And I'm very pleased that with this year group, only 3.6% is below our 90% threshold. We see 90% as a key one in that when we look at the data, it's quite clear, although this is a smaller group, that those who drop below 90% attendance, it does have an effect on their progress rates compared to their peers. So it's important that we monitor that and identify those children and try and help support in terms of um, trying to encourage good attendance at school. Our last key groups, as I said, we have a lot of children coming in new each year, and we've looked to see about the impact that we have um, and how quickly that impact um, improves learning. So we do have programs put in place for our new children coming in to help them support them both pastorally, but also academically, particularly our EAL children, so that we can try and make a difference with their uh, learning quickly and we can see for this year group for instance that children who arrive new in term one we've made a good rate of progress with those across the different areas in fact fantastic progress in some areas um, but our children arrive new in term two and term three that progress in fact can actually take a dip initially on entry so that's an area where we've looked at how we can help support those children and make sure that we put the provision in pastorally and academically in term two and term three to support new children as well as we do when they arrive new to the school at the start of the year. Okay, so all that data that we get from that, we look at how we can feed that back into the learning and into the school and it's incredibly important that if we're collecting all this data and we're using it that and we're looking at it for patterns that we use those patterns and we try and engage as many people within that as possible. So how we do that, at BSJ, we, we look at the data, our internal data, roughly every, every 10 weeks, but we also look at uh, the end of the year and the key analysis and the entry data from the uh, progress tests and from the CAT4. And our analysis from those, as you've seen from the subgroups, we use that to help look at how we're going to adapt learning for the following year. So we look at what needs adjusting, what needs changing, what needs stopping, or what needs spreading. Um, now the process in which we've done that, we've played around with different ways of engaging our staff to get them involved in the uh, feedback and uh, in the assessment and the analysis of that. And one of the, the key ones uh, I hinted at earlier is 
we've looked at the um, data-driven dialogue method, method and we've started first of all by mixing up our year groups uh, in a meeting and then giving them anonymized data at the school, year group and individual level on certain key subjects and we've asked them to look at the patterns that they can see and start to draw out what they think the issues might be um, and how they might support and what patterns there are. And this, we found, has been really successful because it's taken the emotional element out of and the worry about um, if they're being judged as individuals, as class teachers, and so they can look in a much more objective way at the patterns. We then get them to write down uh, and to suggest strategies or changes or things that might need adjusting and how they would do that for the, the data they've got. We then have a break and we come back and we give the data that's been analysed anonymously to the year groups, uh, put them back into year groups all as a, a, the same cohort and get them to have a look at their own data. We uh, put the names and things back on for the children of the classes and we have a look at what feedback the other group has given and also using our knowledge of you know, other patterns, other assessments, internal formative knowledge of the children to, to come up with recommendations for what we think would be um, the need for the changes for the following year. And we then prioritise those across the school for three or four key areas. But the year groups then also have an action plan um, feeding down from that, from the recommendations, and we get much more engagement and understanding and um, buy-in to how those things are going to be enacted in the following year. So we can see here, <coughs> and I've given you an example of, from a couple of years ago of um, that sort of feedback um, and patterns that people have seen. This is looking across years one to six in maths, reading and writing. And they've looked at the different areas across the cohorts where the strength is in attainment, where the progress is being made or progress is slower. They've looked at individuals and they've come up with um, recommendations for things that they feel that would need to be worked on. So, for instance, uh, across the whole of years one to six, we've got year two's reading element is something that needs to be looked at. And year three, maths and writing and also year five and six is writing across the school in terms of those areas. So those might be things we need to work on. Then suggestions uh, for areas we might need to work on. So the SPAG element for our EAL children, getting those mechanical aspects in, phonics at the lower part of the school. So they come up with a range of different um, areas that they would recommend. And we then take in the data from the different groups and the recommendations and try and Simplify those down for a whole school target, but also then have them come up with what they see as their key targets and priorities to work on within their own year groups as well. Another one here, this is for that uh, year A, where from the year group meeting, once they've got their data, they've started to look at areas, knowing what they've taught, knowing their, their children, knowing the form of the um, the pastoral elements as well as the academic elements and looking at their programs and what they're going to do. So for instance, you know, continuing an early bird phonics program to help catch up children on lower phonics stages. Uh, they come up with different ideas. We've got ones down here on historical sources, children's understanding. Now this has come from our own other assessments and the engagement with the, the data from the PTE, PTM and the CAT4 has also uh, got a number of our, our staff enthusiastic about using other pieces of information from other areas of the curriculum to start uh, helping support gen and generate ideas for priorities. <coughs> okay. Um, the CATS as well is something that we use, as I said, we look at the value added uh, elements on our individual attainment. Um, and we look at this, as I said, we do the CATS in year three at the start of Key Stage 2, and we also do CATS again at the end at year six, and we do CATS for those that enter. And the CAT4 test gives indicated targets for attainment that children would get at the end of the Key Stage. 
this was in the old level system and now give an indicator against the 80 to 120 scale used in the UK for the year six assessment. So what we would use that for and what we um, developed is we looked at um, giving an indicated outcome at the end of the key stage, but tracking that back to create a kind of trajectory for learning, but also realizing and making sure it's clear that you know children don't uh, learn in a, um, they don't progress always evenly and that there are plateaus and there are leaps and that um, that's to be taken into account, but also to, to have a look and flag up children where we think the progress is slowing on an individual basis and how we can support those children as well. Um, this is something where we've got down here where we would have a yearly target and what the children would get at the end of the year or be aiming for in terms of their assessments. Uh, we also made sure we have a teacher's assessment as well as uh, the online assessments as well. Um, we would then looking at the value added for us is important to assess how we're doing, uh, but also from an individual level to check with our children that they are making the progress that we need. Um, and often it's been for us very useful in terms of identifying those other children who we need to put more support in as well. So you can see that we look at it on an individual level. We've got the CAPS indicators for what they were going to get at the end of Key Stage 2 from either their on-entry assessment or their assessment in year three. And then we look at the levels that they finally got from the PT, PTM, and we're now using uh, standard age scores to do this, um, to look at what they actually came out with and what difference was made from the normal progress we'd expect. So we can see how those children have achieved higher than was expected or lower than was expected. Um, and hopefully then drill down into what reasons were behind that and what individual needs or EAL aspects we supported to make to help support those things. Um, that then you know gives us a, as a, a track to see how our children have done, what the expected level might have been um, from the trajectory that we planned, and then how our children have progressed. Um, this can be done on a cohort level, but we also look at it individually against the children for how we've done with our maths and our English, our reading. Okay, so going back to um, the different areas that we have, um, I've sort of zipped through some of these, but um, the key ones for me are these where I've focused on the trends and how we use the data to feed back into the learning and then how we've also then looked at um, how we've tried to engage our staff and get them involved in their data. Now, as I say, with the data-driven dialogue aspects and the anonymizing the data has been really successful. We've also been using that on a termly basis as well with internal assessments to look at how we can get our staff using the data from assessments to really impact the learning and move things forward and also it's been really useful for us for the EAL aspects English as additional language for us is, is, a, is a huge area and we can also look at then um, how effective our teaching has been we could look at the models of how we support and how we withdraw or what groups we run to support those areas and then also it's been very useful for us in terms of determining the amount of need that we have and do we have the number of teachers that we need to support those areas. 